Okay, so let's look at the next set of data parameters that we can start to model and visualize. So now we're going to focus on vectors or direction of movement, angles that we can get from curves and surfaces, and then also curvature. So um, lines and curves as they start to bend and change directions, we can start to actually determine what the the radius of those curves are. So these are all valuable things again um, in various ways for modeling. So again, we'll start with this area. And I'm just going to plot around some multiple points, so place them just kind of all over the place randomly. You can obviously do it as a grid, you can do it um, as something kind of more random like this. Let's just kind of give them a little bit more. That looks better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these points except for one. So let's just go ahead and select over and then I'm going to deselect this by holding down the control. I'm going to go to my point components, say set multiple points. So you can see they're all referenced. And then I also want to do it for a single point. So again, point set one point. Similar to when we are creating lines or distances, we can do something very similar, uh, but with points and direction. So let's go to our vector tab here. I'm going to look for vector between two points. So I have my group of points um, and my single points. If I plug in this as kind of my start point and figure out the direction to all these other random ones, I can then plug that into here, and then it gives me a vector for all those directions, as well as the length. To help you just kind of visualize that, we can go to display, <clears throat> go to vector and do vector display. So there's the anchor point. So in this case, we want to use this kind of center point, and then use this as the V. And now we can start to see the direction uh, from one point to the other. So let's just delete that real quick. And what's good about this is that we can use this information to essentially take a point and maybe move it to these points as well. So you'll see if I go to now the transform and move, I can take geometry. In this case, I want to move this single point to all those points. So I can plug that in. If I just plug this into there, it's just going to immediately just kind of move it to that exact point. We don't really see its path of movement, but we can set up some uh, components to do that as well. So let's just hold control to deconnect that. So maybe we want to see a point moving through um, different iterations. We can see a series of points getting from one area to the other. Um, so let's show some of those options. So <clears throat> if you want to just kind of visualize this point moving to all those single ones, uh, we can start off by doing that. So let's go to our vector, vector. And what we want to do is use this amplitude. So it's basically going to use the, the direction of travel. And then it's also going to ask for an amplitude. So how much is it going to go from one to the other? Is it going to go halfway, a quarter of the way, um, the whole distance? We can use the amplitude to figure that out uh, by joining that with our length. So let's just go ahead and connect that for now. And again, defaults to a one value. So if you want to see how, where they are by just equal distances, we can just create a slider and drag this into there to show. You'll see that even if it goes beyond this, that distance, it'll actually go way beyond. So we can use that to kind of figure out where points would go beyond um, these already kind of given parameters. <clears throat> or we can determine a percentage of distance between the initial starting point and this cloud of points. So let's also try that. So in order to do that, we can take their length and use a math equation to find some range of values. So 
I'm going to use the multiplication. Now I'm going to start off with just 0.25. So essentially it's going to take a quarter, 0.25 of that distance, and move those points there. So now they aren't going to have the same equal distance, but rather a percentage of that distance between this point and all these points. And you can see starting at zero versus by the time I get to one or 100%, they'll all start to match this. So obviously points that are further away are going to move out quicker because they're covering more distance versus points that are closer. Uh, it's going to have a little bit of a slower movement, right? So what if we want to see all these different kind of intervals between it as well. This goes back to some of the previous components where we use a range of values. We'll have to tweak it a little bit with the data, but you'll see how you can achieve that too. I'll go to my sets, choose a range. And again, this domain is zero to one, or in this case, 0% uh, to 100%. So all these um, different steps, which are 10, breaks it down into a series. So 0%, 1%, 2%, all the way to 100%. So let's see what happens if I drag that in there. It's not exactly creating what we are hoping for, right? So I can see that it's moved some of these points in one direction versus others, maybe only once or twice. That's because it's essentially <clears throat> looking at nine values, um, so nine of these points versus 11 values. So it's basically going to take the longest value and whichever one's the closest in that data set, it's going to take those remaining factors. So that's why you see that there's um, several in this area because that's um, the first point on that list. And so it's just taking all those, <clears throat> that difference in values between 11 values and nine values. Again, it's kind of, um, Difficult to understand at the moment, but once we get into the tutorials on the data organization, that should start to clarify some things. So in order to see this range of values between zero to one for all these points, we have to graph to this. So I'm gonna right click, say graph. Now we can see all those intervals between each one. So this is how we can start to kind of uh, determine, again, whether you want it to be a percentage. So again, we can kind of just drag it to that way, or we can see a series of points. So this kind of gives us an idea of uh, what that distance is, if it's 50% for this point versus 25% um, in this point. We can actually start to get into those uh, more specific information. but. This should just be a quick kind of easy script to understand vectors and movement of determining that direction and then how to move objects along that direction. Um, we'll get into the more advanced scripting where it doesn't have to just be a linear movement. It actually can be along a designated curve. So uh, that's something else that can be achieved, but for this, uh, purposes, we'll just kind of look at the basics. So let's look at this next one. So um, what we're going to do is draw a curve and begin to analyze the angle of the curve at certain designated points. So we'll do something kind of crazy looking like this. And let's go ahead and reference this curve. And basically, in order to determine the angle of the curve, we need to figure out uh, the angle at certain points. And there's a couple ways we can do that. So I'll go to my curve because essentially I'm going to be analyzing this curve. So I'm going to go to the curve, go to division, and there's a couple ways we can do it. We could just divide it by a certain number of segments or points. We can divide it by um, certain distances or lengths as well. And there's a slight difference to those, obviously, but let's just start off with just dividing this curve into equal lengths of segments. We can, again, add a slider to 
adjust the number of points or the number of angles that we're going to measure. So you can again see that basically this curve, if the, the more you points you create, it's almost like the curve is just made up of a series of points versus if you have something less dense, you're gonna have less uh, curve measurements. So it really kind of depends on what you're looking for um, to determine how many curves or angles you want to determine. But let's just stick around this number right here. What's good is that it's again gonna give you this output of points. It gives you the tangent, which is essentially the direction that this curve is going from left to right. So it's creating essentially just a straight line <clears throat> to give you an idea of the general direction of that. And then it's also giving you these parameters that we can use to analyze the curve a little bit more. And that's gonna be one of the more um, key outputs from this. So I'm gonna go back to analysis. Now I'm gonna look at the horizontal frames. I'll probably want to reduce this just so it's a little bit easier to see once I plug this in. But you can see it's asking for C or a curve, so that's the same curve. And then there's this lowercase t, again, those parameters. <clears throat> you can see it's creating this frame with uh, x and y axes to give you that idea. And so this red line is essentially the x-axis, so this is equivalent to your tangent. So this is, again, kind of the general direction at that exact point. And then there's the green, which is essentially perpendicular to that point, which is what's going to be used to help us actually determine the angle at those designated points. So again, you can see the, the more you add, the more um, frames we start to see. You can start to see, again, how those reds are kind of going in the direction of that curve while the green are staying perpendicular to it. So again, let's just reduce this so it's a little bit easier to see. I don't really need to see this, so I'm gonna just go ahead and turn it off. But let's just show one again. So again, I'm really interested in the angle, so I'm just interested in this green curve, which is the Y axis. So I can go to vector. What's great about this, I can look at my planes and I can deconstruct it so I can see all the angles for the X and the Y as well as the Z, which is just pointing straight up or is vertical. So I can plug that into there. Like I said, the X is equivalent to our tangent. You can see when I hover over between the first one, so 0 0.34, 0 0.9, 0, you can see that's the same value. So X and this uppercase T are the tangents, which are going to be equal versus the y which is going to be perpendicular. And to help you kind of visualize this, you don't have to use it for now, um, but if I go back to my curves and go to primitive, so these are all the different ways to create a curve, I'm going to go to my line SDL which is essentially going to create a line from a start point or these points that we have on our curve, the direction of that line, and then we can also give it a length. So again, I want to start it at these points, which we have our origin point. The direction, again, this is the perpendicular one, so y. And now we can start to see how these um, begin to look a little bit more clearly for our curve. So this is just to kind of help with a visual of these graphs, but it's not actually giving us angles yet. So what we have to do is actually measure this direction versus um, a direction that we want it to be um, um, relative to. So in this case, because it's just drawn on a flat plane, um, again, the x-axis and the y-axis, so in order to actually measure, if we were to imagine this is a a profile curve or a section curve, we can use this of thinking like, okay, like the upward direction of the slope is what we want to measure these against you. And this, so in that case, it's going to be the y-axis. So go back to vector, vector, and use unit y. Easier way to do that is just double click, hit z, or sorry, hit y. And that also brings up the component. So we want to take this 
kind of relative angle of being straight versus all these angles to actually get that um, value. So we can go back to vector and choose angle. And again, we're going to measure this angle versus this angle. And this is going to give us our angle and radians. I pretty much never use radians, so I really don't know how to uh, decipher these values. So what's great is that we can actually convert the angle and radians to degrees, which is a little bit better. So you can go to the trigonometry section and choose this where it says convert angle from radians to degrees. And again, I'm going to grab my sticky note here and look at these values so we can start to see that these are our respective angles in degrees. Something that you might also want to know is what is the angles as a slope percentage? So is this a 5% slope? Is it 100%? Is it something either between or over that? So we can actually use another equation or another component to convert this angle and radians to slope percent. So in order to do that, we want to use a little bit of trigonometry. It's really just finding the tangent of the radian. I'm going to plug this into here. This is going to give the slope in a decimal percentage. So I want to actually multiply this value by 100. So if I just want to, instead of a slider, if I just want a fixed value, I can hit uh, shift to get the quotation marks and hit 100. Because I know I don't need to ever change this because this is part of a equation. I can drag this into here. And one way to just kind of double check that is um, when it comes to slope degrees to percentages, we know that a 45 degree angle, so a rise to run of one to one is gonna give us 100%. So we can see that 46 is pretty close to that 45 degrees. So um, this one should be just slightly over 100%. So if I just copy and paste this, and again, this is list item three. I look at list item three and there you go, 103%. Obviously there's a lot that are over that 100% value, but this is how we can start to understand uh, these different angles a little bit better. Again, if you want to start to visualize what this is actually measuring, we can do that as well. Uh, so we'll show both, again, the degree values and the slope percentage, depending on what you want to do. So we have this one. So now we also want to create a line that's representative of just this Y direction. So I'm going to do Control Z, Control C, Control V to copy and paste that. I'm going to use the same origin point, but instead of the direction from this, I'm going to use the direction from here. So now I can see how it's starting to show that um, measurement. From here, we can begin to create an arc to show what that angle looks like a little bit better. So I can go back to curve primitive, and I'm going to do an arc um, SED, so start, end, and direction. So I need a start, so I actually want to do it somewhere uh, towards the end of these curves. So I'm going to go to analysis and do the point on curve. This essentially just finds a percentage of that curve, so 0.5 or halfway on that curve. I want to maybe bring that up a little bit higher. And as long as these are pretty much the same values, so I can just copy and paste it and drag it for these. So these are going to act as my start and my endpoints. And then the direction, that can just be, again, um, could be either this one, or you could even use this Z. Um, looks like this angle is going to give us a little bit better. Those ones are a little bit more um, crazy looking. So now we can start to see how that measurement looks like in comparing the 
angle of the curve and its um, respective angle to y. So whatever that relative angle difference is. Um, we can again kind of use this to figure out or show those values. So again, maybe I want to use this starting point to show these. I could use it on the arch itself. So I can again kind of take this to use as my center point. I don't really need to see it. If I can go to display, use the text information. So let's use the text 3D so we can control the size a little bit better. So the location of this is going to be at this point. The text to display, we can decide whether we want to show the angle in degrees or percentage. So let's just start off with degrees. We can adjust the size. So let's do 0.25 to adjust that. And then we can also change the color, which I'm fine with for now. And then the justification. So I'm going to do bottom center. And now we can start to, again, see what all these different angles are for a curve. Again, if we want to see what it looks like in percentage, we can just replace that to get that value as well. But this is how we can start to, again, measure the different angles on a curve. And again, it's all responsive. So if I decide to take this and change some of the curves by turning on the points, I can start to take some of these Maybe I want to move them around, and everything will respond to it as well. Which is helpful, because if we decide that we need to stick within a certain slow percent, we can continue to edit it until we get the values that we're looking for. All right? So there you go. So let's move on to the next one, the curvature. So it's not too far off from this one. Um, it's a matter of actually determining what the, instead of what the angle is, so whatever perpendicular, it's actually gonna measure the radius of those same type of points. So again, let's just draw a curve here. I'm going to reference this curve. So again, parameters, geometry, curve. Set one curve. And I'll look at points on this a little bit differently than I did before, just to show you these other options. So the first one, I just divided it by a certain number of uh, points that are all having an equal length. I can actually also determine either by distance or length um, how often I want those points to occur. So I drag this in. And let's just start off with something like two. All right, so these are basically starting from left to right or wherever the start of that curve is. It's every two feet putting a point. And you can see that obviously the curve isn't a perfect um, length of intervals of two, so there is a little bit left over, but we can start to adjust how often we want those as well. So for this, uh, we're going to stick within the curve analysis, but instead of um, looking at frames, we're actually going to look at the curvature. You can even see the icon is essentially looking at a circle as the radius of this. And it's gonna look pretty crazy at first, but it's still gonna be very um, helpful when applying this to some actual real life modeling scenarios. So again, I'm gonna look at the curve, look at these T values. You can essentially see that it's uh, looking at all those points and then drawing a circle that fits that same curvature, right? So the areas that are almost perfectly straight, they're gonna have extremely large circles versus the ones that are in a um, more narrow curve, those are gonna be much smaller. And again, we can kind of start to adjust this to see how that relationship 
works. This one's a little bit easier to see. Obviously, there's these couple of words pretty straight, and that's what's creating a giant curve. But the, the value of this is actually thinking about how either roadways or paths need a certain radius for their um, turning in directions or simply just the accessibility. So you can use this to start to determine which areas have too narrow of a radius, a turning radius, to redesign some of those pathways. So visually, it gives us an idea of what these different curves are in relation to each other, but it doesn't actually tell us the actual radius yet. Uh, we have the point, again, this is the same points. It's also giving us the curvature, which is good. Um, this is a, basically just the direction, which is going to be pretty similar to the tangent. And then there's also the curvature itself. So these are circular curves. And from here, we can actually analyze this to find the radius. So I'm going to go to Analysis, and I'm going to look at Deconstruct Arc. So it's basically an arc, a closed arc. And now I can see that this is giving me some values. So there's the base plane, which is what that grid is. There's the radius. That's what we're really interested in. And there's also this angle. So from here, we can actually start to see, again, the radius of each of those arcs. So I can do something similar to the previous script. I can go to the 3D text to display. So again, I want to look at those points from these points, the text to display or the radius. I can change the size. And then also adjust the justification of this. I could also probably, even if I want to, put the radius in the center of those curves. So I can take these curves, type area to find the center point. It's a little bit difficult for those ones that are really far off. But I can actually use the centroid point to be the location of the text as well. So that's how we can start to, again, uh, measure the different turning degrees of this area. And again, and always manipulate it to get different values, continuously have it kind of respond to the script so that we can use the information that's coming from Grasshopper to inform the actual physical geometry that we've drawn in Rhino. So this is going to wrap up the kind of basic parameters that we can start to use for the future tutorials. Again, it's good to kind of just explore and experiment by messing around with different sliders, um, different physical geometry until you get comfortable. The next phase is how can we take these values and begin to transform uh, physical geometry based off of these parameters. So that will be on the next set of lessons to, again, bring this data and information to something much more decipherable.